So uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, it's uh, my second time in the Philippines but the first time at the Anthology Festival and I have to say it's an excellent event and a very a great location and, and great setup. It really is a, a festival uh, and I've enjoyed it uh, so far. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, a number of projects and my uh, role uh, on them and the role of the engineer and, and basically it's, a, it's going to be a bit of a roller coaster. I, I hope you're in for lots of images and I'm going to talk about eight or ten projects. So just get yourself in, uh, prepared for that. But uh, first uh, we have to start with the, uh, the local experience yesterday, my first uh, balut. Uh, last night, uh, which was washed down with uh, whiskey, a uh, very tasty um, start to the uh, uh, time here. So I've worked with the company Arup since I graduated in 1986. So I'm in my uh, 34th year with the firm and have uh, worked globally. The, the firm was founded by the engineer and designer uh, and philosopher Ove Arup in 1946 in London. And Ove had a vision to reimagine how architects and engineers could collaborate on projects to achieve better outcomes. Uh, so he set up with a firm deliberately to address issues such as a responsible design for society, pursuit of excellence in design, and the uh, you know a focus on multidisciplinary uh, work what he called total architecture, and, and working in a way with people and societies that was fair and honorable uh, dealings. And his vision of what the firm Arab should be was enshrined in uh, the key speech which he wrote in 1969, between then and 1972, when he retired and handed over the ownership of the firm to the employees. So Arup is effectively an employee-owned firm. We are currently approaching 17,000 engineers and designers and consultants globally. And we are, we would say, the, the largest independent practice in the world in, in uh, engineering. And, you know, the, the practice in the early days Probably it's the Sydney Opera House, which Ove collaborated with Jorn Utzon, and many other engineers, of course, were involved in the competition and the realization of uh, the Sydney Opera House. And it's certainly a project that is uh, iconic, truly, uh, and uh, speaks volumes about what the firm is about. In the early days, there was a focus on buildings with uh, projects such as the Pompidou Center, uh, with Renzo Piano and uh, Richard Rogers, which involved the engineer Peter Rice, who uh, I'll be showing photographs of him. He is one of the three engineers who have been honored with the title of RIBA gold medalist for architecture uh, in their lives. Ove Arup was one of them, uh, and Peter Rice was another. And in Asia, the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank is probably one of our most recognized projects, but we are well established in East Asia and Australasia, and we have an office here uh, in Manila, which is rapidly growing, and uh, we're just about moving office, so uh, hopefully we'll meet you there someday. And we're well known for public uh, arts projects, and, and it's not just the very big projects. I personally work on a lot of very small uh, projects, and uh, hopefully I'll get time to show you those. Uh, this is a famous project. It's the Manil Art Gallery in uh, Houston, Texas, again with uh, Renzo Piano. Now, it's, it's not going forward. So the um, the... You know, the firm was set up with, is it going okay now? No. The firm was set up, as I said, with uh, uh, Ove's vision in mind of what the firm should be about. And by transferring the ownership to the staff, 
he basically, it was set up in such a way that the firm could never be bought or sold by the employees. It's in a trust ownership. And we were basically masters of our own destiny. So the focus of the firm is always about what the firm and the people who join the firm want it to be about. We have no external shareholders. We have no external debt. So we are truly masters of our own destiny in, the, in that respect. And the, um, you know, we, we grow and we will continue to grow, not for growth's sake. We're not in pursuit of turnover. We're not in pursuit uh, of profit, though, of course, we do need to make a profit to remain viable and sustainable. And uh, so the primary focus is around the aims and around focusing on design. And our size is important because we as a firm want to be able to address the largest and most complex problems being faced by societies around the world. We want to be of a size and the range of skills that we can undertake the most difficult uh, uh, projects. And that drives, that's one of the drivers for our growth. We want to be a relevant firm in the built environment. And we want to have a voice that is global and local. And we are very much focused on des uh, delivering locally. So in more recent times in Asia, the firms become famous for projects such as the uh, Bird's Nest. Uh, I lived in Beijing for eight years during this period and witnessed the construction of the Bird's Nest the water cube, and the CCTV project, which I'll uh, talk about. But we're not just about buildings. We've also uh, equal-sized branches that focus on uh, infrastructure, and also more recently in the last two decades in, in consulting. So that is uh, the core of our business around the world. And uh, I've talked already about Ove and his vision for the firm. This is Ove on site at the Sydney Opera House, uh, probably in the, that photo is probably from the uh, early 70s. And when we started the firm, uh, the firm chose this as job number one. Okay? This is the job number one. Now, it's a bit unusual. This job is actually from 1937. It's one Ove did as a contractor with his brother and Lubetkin, the uh, architect. It was for uh, a very sophisticated client, uh, a penguin, uh, or a group of penguins, and it's a thing of beauty. And it was also something that it, uh, was technically challenging, the, the use of very thin concrete forms, three-dimensional forms at that time was uh, quite unusual in this respect. The, the project is, is still exists, uh, and, uh, but the penguins have, have moved on to uh, other uh, headquarters since then. So, the, you know, why did I get involved in engineering? Um, I got involved in engineering because, by accident really, but it was because images like this uh, fascinated me. And, um, I could see in them something, you know, the use of nature, providing something practical, something that was a, a, an appropriate technology and solved a problem, and, and one would say uh, something that's, that's actually beautiful uh, uh, as well. I was also, as a young uh, uh, student, very interested in the environment, and uh, although that's a very long time ago, 40 years ago, I was already conscious of the degradation of the environment uh, in my hometown and in our country. Uh, I'm from Ireland. Little was I to know that uh, within a, a year of joining the firm, I would be in West Africa uh, building bridges, footbridges, a 120 meter cable suspension walkway access to a national park, to a, a rainforest, and our client was the World Wildlife Fund at that time. And that was an introduction to uh, you know, the wider role of the engineer and designer, uh, not just as uh, uh, office-based, uh, but also I was the chief procurement officer uh, and also um, the contractor, and led the construction of the project with uh, a, a number of uh, volunteers from around the world. Uh, I also got to grow a beard, and I'm not going to do that again. 
straight off of that project, I took my degree in architecture. Well, that's how I like to put it. Uh, I worked on Kansai Airport. Uh, straight after coming back from Cameroon, I was asked to join Peter Rice, who's there with his head down, dr always drawing, always sketching, and Renzo, using his ha hands, of course, to talk like all Italians do. And I spent two and a half years with this combination of architect engineer, and it was the most fantastic experience uh, that provided the foundation for the future of my career as an engineer, but also as a collaborative engineer working with architects. The way they worked together, they respect, they showed each other, the trust that was there between them when one said something and the other said something. And uh, they enjoyed, they were good friends. They were very close friends, actually. And they, they worked very closely together. Also, the way they behaved towards me. I was a young graduate, you know, and what did I know? But when they were together, they talked in French. Uh, they were both fluent French speakers. Peter was based in Paris. Uh, Renzo had an office in Paris. When I walked into the room or anybody else who didn't speak French, they would immediately switch to English. And they would listen to what I said. And that, that experience of what collaboration looks like, good collaboration, set the mark for me for the rest of my career. And it is still the benchmark against which I measure relationships with architects uh, around the world. And uh, I'm lucky enough to say that I've worked with uh, quite a few uh, in my career. Kansai also was my first real experience of a big project on site, and I spent three weeks uh, touring uh, around the world to see where elements were fabricated and the actual uh, construction on site. Having finished up in, uh, in Japan, I was parachuted literally into this project. It's the Congrexpo. It's uh, three buildings in one. Uh, it's by Rem Koolhaas, and it's in Lille in northern France. And this was my introduction uh, to, to this man, and you're going to hear quite a lot about him. So that was 1991, and uh, uh, I'm still collaborating with OMA, actually of a project on site, Taipei Performing Arts Center, which hopefully I'll show you, uh, which is ongoing. And again, a, I saw in Rem's uh, behavior and the way he treated engineers and the respect he showed for Arup and for the team of engineers at Arup who worked with him uh, was uh, remarkable. And it is the reason why the combination of Arup and OMA together has created such amazing buildings around the world. It's because by the time we came to do CCTV, there was total trust between uh, the two organizations. And it made putting forward a, a project like CCTV to the public and to the Chinese government, to the Politburo, that we were deadly serious about what we were proposing to do. And the, um, I like to say that you know, while my degree in architecture was with uh, Renzo, my uh, uh, PhD or master's or whatever was uh, with, with REM, uh, and uh, lucky enough to work very closely with them. These are old pictures uh, from 1991. And I put these in, uh, very terrible pictures, but that's me looking at, a, at an architectural model of, of the roof of Congrexpo. And to, uh, to my uh, left are Rem Koolhaas and Mark Shandell, who was the project architect. Rem's practice, OMA, was not a business. It was not a business, it was a university. And people came in and they clocked up time, six months a year uh, before they moved on. The best uh, and the most determined and those with the stomach for it uh, would see through a project and deliver a project and then move on and, and start their own practice. And so there's a, I actually don't have it as an image here, but there's a, a if you Google it online and look for REM babies, you'll find this whole uh, map of all of the practices who pass through OMA. Uh, you know, people like Ola Sheeran, Bjarke Ingels, Jeannie, Jeannie Gang, uh, they are all there, you will see. 
And those relationships formed back then are relationships that stand today. So this is Mark Shandell still uh, with his partner, Jeannie Gang, who uh, is the founding partner of uh, Studio Gang, who are Chicago-based architects. I'm working with them today. Those relationships were forged 30 years ago and stand, have stood the test of time. So the first sort of real project I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, Casa de Musica. Uh, this is uh, uh, with OMA. And um, hilariously, this started as a house for a, a Dutch client who uh, didn't really like the rest of his family. So he had a house but he knew he had to live with them. So the house was in two parts, and, and in between was the space, the no man's land, or the, uh, where they could meet when they both agreed uh, that that's what they wanted to do. So I met the client, and uh, uh, Rem eventually lost patience with this client and fired the client, because the client kept procrastinating about whether to go ahead with the project. And at the same time, the uh, competition for Casa de Musica came up, a music hall for, to celebrate uh, Oporto, or Porto in Portugal's uh, 2001 year of culture in, uh, in Europe. And after firing the client, he took, we literally discovered that, well, you know, that house was actually suitable to become a house for a concert hall, and, and basically uh, zoomed it up on the photocopier. And uh, Rem invite, after we won the competition, Rem invited the client back into his office and said, that was your project, now it's going to Portugal. <laughs> the, this is the competition model, um, and at that stage we didn't actually know what the structure was going to be for this project. We didn't actually know a lot about it, it was more we're figuring out could we get something to work eventually if we won. The client actually thought it was a glass object, uh, and that's not what it ended up as. It ended up as a, a solid form. But uh, the concept was it was a quartz-like form uh, from which uh, various programs were extracted. For example, the main hall, the smaller uh, auditorium, uh, a lot of uh, viewing rooms and video rooms, uh, the entrance, uh, views towards the city, Various other functions of the, uh, the concert hall were extracted from that object, uh, with the last being the roof terrace and bar, to give uh, the, the competition entry. When we won, we then really started to think, well, how the hell are we going to get this uh, to work? Uh, OMA are famous for their blue foam models. This was yet another model that did not stand up uh, on its own. So we had to figure out literally how to, uh, to, to keep it standing up permanently. These are the very early sketches on napkins, on bits of paper, sitting with Rem and his team in, in Rotterdam or in London when he came to visit us. And bit by bit, trying to figure out what are the options here uh, to make it work, what can we rely on for stability, uh, Portugal's moderately, moderately uh, seismic. And eventually, bit by bit, looking at the form, looking at the geometry, uh, in discussion, over and back, thinking about how it would be built, we eventually arrived at uh, decisions on the materiality of the project and on the, the final form and shape uh, of the building. And as you can see, all of this is uh, delivered and debated very quickly on, uh, on paper. Also, OMA famously use an awful lot of uh, blue foam models, not to be precious about them, but to actually rip them apart and put them back together uh, in a design process. So once we um, established the, uh, that we were going to make the building out of concrete, we started uh, looking at the analysis and carrying out as the engineers on the project the analysis of the building. We were also MEP and uh, engineers looking at the, uh, uh, at the um, heating, ventilation, air conditioning of the project. And bit by bit, building up a knowledge of the, of the project. But interestingly, 
you know, we, were, we did have 3D models of the project, but it was, it was actually the physical models built by OMA that really revealed what, how complex the project was and, importantly, where the hidden spaces were within the object uh, when you uh, inserted floors and stairs and circulation. And one of those spaces was basically a, a found space, and it, uh, this was it in the model when they found it. Uh, and uh, that's how it was realized uh, eventually. So the role of model making uh, in the pro process was uh, very important. The project then went on site, and this is the, all of the concrete. We decided we were going to do it in white concrete. All of the concrete for the entire building was mixed on site, mixed and batched uh, on site. And the importance of a continuous prototyping of the project on site to get the color of concrete right, the finish, the release agents, etc., all happened. Oops. I don't know how that happened, but uh, let's go back. Um, was a continuous process on site with the final decisions being made before uh, allowing it to start. And it included, luckily we had done all that research because there were problems during construction when white concrete looked like this. Uh, but we knew that eventually the sun would cause that staining to remove. So there was a, there was a moment of panic, uh, for sure, but in time the sun took care of everything as it had. And uh, we did lots of research, including this is a, a, a typical OMA unfolded plan of, a, of one of their buildings with the layout of the, uh, the formwork for it. And this is Casa de Musica under construction, looking more like uh, a shipyard. The complexity of the building, uh, the contractor was a Portuguese-Brazilian uh, collaboration, and the skill of the uh, contractor to realize the project, they learned a lot through the process, uh, but they were able to take, deal with some of the most complex uh, formwork uh, to realize the project with uh, frequent visits from, from REM. And we had a, an enlightened client who every year held a three or four day music festival on the site during construction. It took about five or six years of construction and every year uh, there would be a music festival with people pouring over the building site, experiencing the hall that was going to uh, be part of their city uh, someday in the future. And eventually the building Became, came close to, to finishing, and this is a, a walk around. You can see the white concrete, and just how sharp it is. It's a monolithic uh, structure. There, is no, there are no construction joints, expansion joints, sorry, uh, in the entire uh, building. And you can see just how sharp that uh, concrete work is. It's an exceptional building, and has proven extremely popular uh, with the public. And as I said earlier, you know, the, the building is there, but why is it there? Um, you know, in, intense uh, collaboration, uh, some very important signage there uh, within the, the building. But it was a, an intense collaboration between Arab and Oma, and actually the contractual situation on that project was quite complex uh, and difficult. But it was down to the team. Uh, the teamwork that was set up between Arab OMA and other consultants uh, to realize the project. And the team was there from start to finish uh, to realize the project, and we made friends for life. That team had such close collaboration that when it came to the CCTV competition, there was total trust and collaboration, interdependency between the two uh, firms. And uh, the uh, that was very, very important in undertaking CCTV. REM had to decide between doing the Twin Towers competition, the replacement for the Twin Towers, or CCTV. And together, you know, he took the view that China was the future. So we did the CCTV competition. CCTV can be defined as uh, something cut from a, a pyramid, if you like, in, in seven cuts. A uh, very complex building. In, in total, on the master plan, there's one million square meters. In the CCTV building, including its basement, it's 580,000 square meters. It's a factory. It's a media factory. It's a brief that will never happen again. Media has moved 
on so far, and decentralization and the breakup of uh, media monopolies uh, around the world means this was a brief that will never happen again. And in the process we, uh, of design, we realized, uh, again, three weeks from the competition deadline, we still didn't have a solution for the structure, the lifts, uh, uh, the MEP we had sorted, but on the structure, and we were searching and searching for what, how do we build this. We knew we had to make the object into a tube, into a structural tube, but we couldn't make that concrete. Um, so we referred to a project we were working on at the time, the Whitney Museum in New York, where stress analysis had helped shape the openings and windows in that particular project. And we did the same process on CCTV, but instead of it being a, 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 a solid surface, we just generated the surface, surface randomly, uh, we triangulated it, and analyzed that surface, and the red spots are the ones working hardest and the blue the lightest. And this mo that model that I made is about two inches tall. Uh, we photographed it, sent it over to Rotterdam, and uh, said, OK, in the red zones, we want to double up or quadruple the density of uh, the triangulation. And in the blue areas, we want to half or quarter it. So uh, the eventual result was that the red areas uh, also became blue. So we had a much more even distribution of the forces around the structure by just adding or subtracting. Traditionally, our engineers would say, oh, just make the member bigger or smaller, but here we just made the structure more dense. And this was very, very important uh, later on in the uh, project. And here's a, a summary of the building. And, and basically, the competition, that idea uh, at the competition was what was built. Uh, it proved very resilient to the real design process once we won the competition. And uh, the reason Rem liked it as well at the time was it, it seemed that this pattern was contrived. And actually an architect asked me, uh, Kevin asked me last night, said it's contrived, isn't it? And I said, that's why Rem chose it. It looks contrived, but it's actually driven totally by the uh, engineering, uh, uh, by the, the demand of the, uh, the structure in the seismic zone. And while others, while we were busy, um, uh, imagining how to get the building to stand up. Others were uh, amusing themselves. So we, we heard in August 2002 that we won, and uh, the project quickly went to site, and we began to imagine the, the project being realized on site. That's the view from my desk in Beijing. Uh, so I arrived in Beijing in 2005 and witnessed the entire construction uh, and detailed design of, of the project. The engineering uh, that went in, two years by a team of up to 400 architects and engineers realized CCTV. And one of the greatest achievements of that project was uh, the use of computing power to analyze uh, and convince the authorities that the building was uh, safe and resilient and uh, would uh, perform adequately uh, and superbly in, in earthquakes. And uh, at the same time, you know, engineers don't get paid a lot, so I started a sideline in cake making. Actu actually, this is uh, uh, my 40th birthday, and uh, rewarded with a, a CCTV cake. And uh, from this, we figured out how to make CCTV. You just need a coat hanger. Um, now, this cake making became very important la later in the project, as you you'll see. You know, China has a, has a reputation for big projects uh, see, and uh, all sorts of issues. CCTV only looked really like a Chinese construction site during the uh, very early days of the, the piling. Immediately after that, it turned into a world-class, sophisticated, well-run site, uh, realizing one of the most complex uh, buildings in the world. Uh, with a, a steel crew of only about six or 700 on, on site at any one time. And we witnessed some of the most uh, amazing uh, pieces of steelwork and, and construction uh, in China's history. Uh, the workers were also quite impressed with what they were building. Uh, writing on the side of the steelwork, CCTV will never fall down. 
The view from my window, as I said, we rapidly saw progress on the construction of CCTV. And when the cantilever started, we saw some of the most uh, uh, amazing images of people hanging out over the Beijing skyline, over the, uh, the site, uh, in what was uh, truly uh, an amazing moment. And we, we had to pinch ourselves to, to know, uh, to believe what was going on. And uh, eventually, the two towers came to meet each other. But we wouldn't let them kiss until very early in the morning, because they both had to be at the same temperature uh, and cool in the morning. So the connection, it was written in our specification, was that these two 100,000-ton uh, each building was of that weight were joined together uh, when they would have the least amount of thermal movement going on in them. And that connection was made uh, early in the morning, and seven key pieces of steel were dropped in with steel, temporary steel pins uh, to bring the two towers, leaning towers, to suddenly uh, start behaving as one. And by 2007, end of 2007, the building was linked. And Beijing really woke up to see the uh, project realized with uh, the last pieces of steel being put in place uh, by uh, 2007 and the facade following soon after it and the project uh, dominating the Beijing skyline alongside China World Trade Center. And uh, for the first time in my career, uh, my kids decided I was cool uh, when CCTV appeared on The, uh, the Simpsons. So I, I no longer had to explain what I do. They, they got it. They got it. Uh, and, and back to the cake business. This is a, a cake shop opposite the site entrance. Uh, so if you wanted a, a CCTV wedding cake, you had to order it five days in advance uh, of your wedding. And uh, I got 50% of all profits from that. Uh, don't tell anybody, though. So CCTV looked finished for the Olympics, and the Olymp Olympics came and went. And CCTV is incredible as you walk around it and see it from different angles. Its place in the skyline, its emblem uh, as a, a symbol of China's progress and prowess in the world, but also its daring. China was incredibly daring in taking on these projects. You know, you think of a society like that where people would go to extreme lengths to avoid losing face. For them to trust the team, just on the basis of a competition, that what we were proposing was realizable and true. That sketch of a looped building could have been done by any student, really, if you think about it. Uh, but when it was Arab with OMA saying that this was a real project, that is one of the reasons CCTV exists. It was the, the client trusted that collaboration uh, of architect and engineer to deliver the best uh, architecture uh, and engineering in the world. And uh, it also makes a great hat. Uh, I got to wear this at the Council of Tall Buildings last year. Mm. This is another OMA project which I, I put in at the last moment because um, I wanted, uh, I think it's relevant uh, because of uh, seismic issues here. Uh, this is the Taipei Performing Arts Center, which is currently on site. And again, it was a, a collaboration between uh, architect and engineer to realize something. Uh, basically, Taipei Performing Arts Center is three theaters in one, uh, with all of the backstage in a very, very complex uh, cube, and with the auditoria sticking out of that cube. And the... Um, and allowing the two theatres, the three theatres actually to be joined up. In the end, two uh, are allowed to join up for certain uh, shows. Incredibly complex, lots of engineering going into it. But one of the key decisions was we knew the cube inside structurally would be a mess. And we wouldn't know the final arrangement of it until the last day. So we came up with a strategy where we put all, most of the gravity and all of the seismic resisting component of the building into the cube, only into the cube wall. And we said, that's our territory. Do what you like everywhere else. But this is ours. We will define this. And that strategy worked in the competition. And combined 
with base isolating the building, putting it on friction pendulum bearings, meant we were able to save 40% of the steel weight because the building uh, does not experience uh, the full effect of the earthquake, but a highly modified input from the earthquake. So the building is much, much lighter. And that saving in steel paid for the base isolation and for the extra half floor of basement that was required uh, to house those. And uh, that's them in place. They don't look particularly uh, stunning, uh, but they are a very good place to have lunch. So the project's on site at the moment, and uh, this was taken a couple of years ago, and this was taken just a few weeks ago. Uh, we hope to, it, that it'll be complete this year, sorry, uh, next year, and opening in 2022. And the last of the four projects, this is a collaboration with Jeannie Gang. And it's the American Museum uh, of Natural History uh, in, in Manhattan. And it's a new wing uh, to, uh, addition to the, uh, uh, to the museum that we won through competition. In, it took two or three years, the process. I think we won it about four years ago now. And uh, Studio Gang, Jeannie was uh, inspired by ice caverns and uh, natural forms in, uh, in geology. She has a particular interest in geology. And those helped inform the nature of uh, the design for the Gilder Center uh, in the competition and still is the driver for, as the design uh, develops. It's now on site. Uh, and I put it in here, you know, first of all, there was a great collaboration between architect and engineer in, from very basic uh, instructions and, and guidance to the architect about how to make free-flowing surfaces and how to get forces to flow uh, around those surfaces uh, for our benefit uh, and things that are good and things that are not so good into developing then into the most sophisticated modeling and iteration and uh, in fact, in some cases, machine learning uh, modeling to come up with a, a, a definition for the canyon structure. And that was all, uh, has all happened. The, the last big story on this is that, you know, how do you then make that canyon? And we wanted to do it in, in concrete, and we wanted it to look like concrete. Um, but to do it with uh, three-dimensional formwork, such a complex, natural flowing shape, would have been incredibly expensive and complicated. So we ruled that out. And we looked at precast, and we ruled that out. We didn't want joints. We didn't want to see joints. Uh, and it was also very expensive. And then there are lots of very clever uh, sort of CNC cut, cast uh, brick and cut brick that you can make into all sorts of objects. A lot of these images are from... Uh, um, of projects that were at Venice Biennale, but not relevant. We eventually uh, settled on, and our initial intuition was that shotcrete was the way to achieve it. So we brought uh, Jeannie and Mark down into the bowels of New York, uh, down into the Second Avenue subway and transit systems, uh, to one of our projects where uh, shotcrete was being used uh, to form very complex three-dimensional tunnels you see, our, our project, you know, it had to be roughly within that sort of uh, shape and dimensional check, but it didn't have to be perfect, except where, say, it met facade or where it met a bridge or whatever. And uh, we, we realized that uh, spread concrete could do incredibly, the, the skilled workers in this area so it can do incredibly complex forms, uh, but very cheaply, uh, and they can be finished off uh, to look uh, in different ways from uh, scored uh, and we experimented with lots of different finishes but in the end uh, settled for a, a finish that looks like concrete uh, and the client tested and tested and tested that research and said uh, you know can we do it a another way and everything they came up with and every contractor who came in said no they couldn't beat uh, this, this method. And what I like about this, it's a nice story of, of the power of computing and digital and being able to iterate and machine learn. But still, it's in terms of realization of the project, it's, it's down to a, a very 
sort of uh, basic, if you like, uh, technology, spread concrete with, that's hand finished to realize the project. And I think the, it's, it's this, trying to make projects over sophisticated is, is something that we're seeing a lot of. This, I think, is a good marriage between budget, technical feasibility, construction feasibility, uh, and technology to realize something new. So that's it for the, uh, the projects. I am going to move on to another topic. I think I have 15 minutes left. You're going to 20. Good, right. So uh, I'm going to talk about bamboo and timber. And uh, I think these are materials that are unknown but I would largely say misunderstood by engineers and architects and, and I think it's people's perception of these materials is the biggest barrier uh, to them being, uh, being part of the future for sustainable, uh, for sustainable environmentally friendly and uh, renewable uh, construction. Not just of small scale houses, which I'll show you, but through to uh, large scale tall buildings and uh, large density uh, buildings. They are part of the future and it's something that Arab supports uh, through research. Because we own the firm, we decide how much money we invest in research every year. And uh, we put tens of millions uh, of US dollars into uh, R&D and investigations and collaborators, uh, sorry, collaborations with external parties, universities, uh, developers, designers, uh, to explore new avenues. Uh, and we also do some of those projects through community engagement where we use our own money to pay to look after our own costs. And we do a lot of pro bono work and also support uh, collaborators on projects that particularly focused on the poorest and most vulnerable uh, people in societies. As I said earlier, you know, Arab wants to be relevant for, in relation to all of the issues being put forward by society. And that includes uh, housing. Oh, by the way, I, I, uh, uh, I was talking to someone last night and I was explaining that all the guys in Arab who work on timber uh, around the world call themselves timberistas. And I was saying, well, you know, what is it, bamboo-istas? Uh, and he said, no, 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 it's bambassadors. So uh, um, there, there's the term. I said I'd, I'd get it in there. Uh, very sustainable, renewable, fast growing, comes in all shapes and sizes, uh, it, it's bendy, uh, it can be difficult to work with. But worldwide, there's a renewed interest in the use of bamboo. And it's using raw bamboo in many cases to produce fantastic architecture, uh, even civil engineering projects. And there are new products, uh, engineered bamboo is a new product uh, and it allows us to rethink how we can use bamboo in construction. But bamboo isn't new, uh, you know, I would say it's incredibly uh, um, common here in the Philippines as it is in many other countries around the world in, in terms of uh, housing in particular. But it's uh, also been used successfully in, uh, in larger buildings in the past. And there's a lot to be learned from the past. You know, there's a lot of research from Costa Rica, Colombia, El Salvador, and the Philippines right now into the future of bamboo uh, in, in uh, construction. And all of the big issues like termites and uh, water ingress, uh, fire protection, etc., have all been addressed. It's been studied worldwide. Uh, and bamboo is incredibly resilient in earthquake. Bamboo lathing with a chicken wire mesh and uh, finished with a, a cement a sand screed is incredibly effective uh, in seismic and provides a, a um, very low cost, resilient housing for uh, very vulnerable uh, communities. And we've been researching with that with a number of partners and uh, who, who I should mention, uh, you know, I've mentioned the other countries involved, but here, in uh, the Philippines, it's Habitat for Humanity with the Hilti Foundation and the um, uh, Bes Bahe uh, Foundation and many others. Uh, there's a program underway to build 10,000 houses. In, uh, it's in uh, Negros Occidental, Occidental uh, out of using bamboo and other appropriate technology. 
and we are part of that research. It's global research. This is the nice thing about working for a global company that truly thinks globally. We are collaborating on projects around the world, and all of that learning is being shared uh, across the projects. And not just Arab is a firm that does not do this with information. The, the firm uh, and its success is built from sharing. We are not a protective organization. We put our learning on the internet and out there as soon as we possibly can because we want to influence the agenda in the built environment. And there's been lots of research done and uh, even a shake table tests. This might work. No, hold on. If I go back, I'll give it. Is it going to work? Yeah. So they just imagine a lot of rumbling noise going on here. But uh, you know, we can use highly sophisticated computer modeling these days to do very uh, realistic uh, modeling of, of structures. But we quite often do physical testing as well to uh, demonstrate visually to people the, uh, the ability of uh, technologies to, to uh, deliver. And in this case, this is a prototype house made from bamboo with the bamboo wall uh, resisting a very large earthquake. This is uh, modeling uh, one of the, it's for El Salvador, one of the most seismic, seismically active uh, places on the planet. And here's the uh, prototype house. I think that one's in, in El Salvador. Anyway, that project, as I said, is learning. There's cross-learning, Costa Rica, Colombia, uh, and here in the Philippines, as I said. And uh, that's a project that Arup is very proud uh, to be part of. And here in the Philippines, uh, that uh, delivery of 10,000 homes uh, is planned to be by 2022. And all of the learning has been published. Uh, it's been gathered. We help write the codes in bamboo around the world. And all of the learning is captured and delivered in uh, multi-languages uh, around the world. I'm going to talk about timber now. Uh, timber uh, doesn't mean, you know, plant 100 mahogany trees tomorrow for your kids to sort of build their houses out of in 100 years' time or 50 years' time, whatever. Um, Timber in the past was, was lumber. It's just rough, uh, rough cut timber. And lots of beautiful buildings have been achieved and survived uh, made from timber. Timber has a future, uh, a very, very important and bright future. And I think it's something here in the Philippines that, that uh, uh, industry and the authorities uh, need to look at seriously. Architects and engineers are part of that uh, examination of timber as an alternative uh, material. The new generation of timber uh, industries producing engineered timber uh, are allowing us to build buildings that uh, couldn't have been realized before. And the use of digital uh, and CNC cutting uh, has also facilitated the revolution that's happening around the world in timber. And a, originally behind the curve, Europe was ahead of the curve in Australia in timber research and promotion. Uh, but now America has come along. They've suddenly realized, actually, this is it. Uh, and so there's a scramble around the world to introduce timber products. Uh, and uh, we are part of that with a multitude of other organizations. And the issues of durability, strength, uh, fire resistance have all been studied, codified, and bit by bit, codes are being changed to allow buildings of 20, 30 stories in timber. That's no, not a dream anymore. They are being built, and we are building them. Um, and the uh, other issues that, that come with timber, you know, it's, a, it's sustainable. The, these products are made from fast-growing soft trees, not hardwoods. You can leave your hardwoods in the forest where they belong. You need to um, have managed plantations to uh, grow this timber and to supply the industry. And that is possible in most countries uh, around the world. And it's, it's uh, CNC cutting is one of the things that's revolutionized, and it's the precision cutting of instruments. This photograph's taken 15 years ago. This was probably the only machine there was in the world that could cut to uh, 0.1 millimeter precision. 
Now they're everywhere around the world. And the robotics and the uh, digital production is meaning that demonstration projects such as Parasol in Seville and uh, the um, uh, Pompidou Metz uh, building by uh, Shigeru Ban uh, are showing people what can be done with timber. But these are very showy uh, projects. Um, this is, you know, what's relevant is, you know, can we do high density, tall uh, buildings and timber? And uh, buildings are being realized and codes are changing. And the, the project on the right there, 2019, is a project that we currently have under design in uh, Amsterdam called Hout. Or, and th these buildings are made up of components. Uh, so most of the work is factory based with components being delivered to site. The floors, uh, the walls, everything. For buildings over 20 stories, uh, typically we will need a concrete core or a steel core or some collaboration. Timber is just not stiff enough to economically uh, provide uh, wind and seismic resistance over 20 stories. Uh, so you'll see hybrid structures of concrete and timber. And this is a typical timber floor being made in a factory, all pre-programmed. And, uh, you know, in, in this is uh, Switzerland or Germany, sorry. Uh, so labor is expensive. In a low uh, cost labor economy, uh, this would all be done by hand. And uh, elements uh, up to 20 meters uh, in length being, being fabricated and used to build buildings all over Germany and Switzerland uh, today. And in places where you need fire separation between floors, a certain thickness, and acoustic separation, you can get timber and concrete to work in composition. They, they work as a composite. Uh, and this is one being fabricated in Germany. And this is what they look like, stacked up, ready to go to site. And walls, obviously. So all of these components can be put together uh, and with the power of digital to control uh, quality, dimensional, these elements are dimensionally stable. They are incredibly accurate in dimension. And uh, in terms of the environment, they're incredibly responsible. And if you think, think of it, you're, locking, you're taking carbon from the atmosphere and you're locking it up in your building. And uh, uh, so the, on sustainability grounds, uh, a very strong story. It's very fast construction. The elements are very light compared to precast concrete. So it's actually faster than precast concrete. And the connections are uh, very simple. And this is a headquarters building for a, a, a media company in the UK. I think it's Sky uh, is the one. So why would speed, low impact, safer acoustic sustainability and cost? In a, a Western context, especially, it's when you take into account the cost of finishes in buildings, uh, timber is highly competitive. But, you know, we are not going to be able to continue using concrete and steel in the way we had. And it's just a matter of time before that is understood by everybody. Um, one in ten of our clients are pioneers who drive this agenda, and they're the buildings we're doing. But eventually, uh, codes and uh, the law uh, and when the true cost of energy and the damage it's doing, you know, carbon extraction, po fossil fuels are making to our environment, when the true cost of that is added into the equation, uh, timber is going to uh, be the dominant building material, engineered timber construction. So it's best to get on board. Now, uh, I'm going to keep going. Okay, I'm going to keep going. And this is sort of a, a related, it's, it's sort of marrying timber and technology. And I hope that, you know, this, these uh, projects will sort of inspire exploration uh, uh, in what you're doing. This is, um, when people think of, of digital uh, uh, um, uh, processing and manufacturing, there's, there's one, uh, a project called WikiHouse. Perhaps you've seen it before and seen it online. It's sort of 
basically you can design a house uh, on this platform and uh, get the uh, CNC print printouts and you can send it to a CNC cutter and you can cut your house uh, in a for, you know in a local uh, manufacturer fabricator out of timber panels uh, and go and build your house uh, and it's Lego and you know your your house arrives in the back of a van and uh, and you put it together with timber joints and finish it in timber cladding and, and there is your house. Um, it's interesting, but this is already old. You know, it's uh, it's it's of interest. It's it's projects like this I, I, that really intrigue me. And I, I didn't give my talk a title, but um, one one subtitle is uh, you know what impresses this engineer. Uh, been around for a long time, so I, you know, I'm difficult to get excited about things, uh, but this, this I like. This is a project where we do with the Architect Association in Hook Park in the UK. So the Architects Association have a dedicated workshop, sort of countryside um, location where they experiment. The students go and spend months living on site and experimenting with all of the technologies that are out there. And this is a project, it's, uh, it's called the, the Wood, I think it's the Wood Barn, where uh, hopefully you can see that image clearly, but it's basically, uh, um, they're based in a forest, and all over the forest there are logs just lying around. And what they did was they, they went and did three-dimensional photography, photographic surveying of all of the wood in the, uh, in the forest that's lying around. And turned that into digital models, uh, and then manipulated uh, those elements uh, to, to best fit different pieces together to make a, a particular structure. And so, again, you can have machine learning helping with that. You know, oh, this goes better with this, or what about this? You know, all of that is automated in the software. And uh, then a, a robot, by the way, if you want to buy one of these, they're about a million dollars. Uh, but they're getting cheaper. They're getting cheaper. They're now very common. Um, and then you just hand uh, the log to your robot who uh, works away and uh, precision cuts and uh, in certain uh, locations can place and connect uh, elements together uh, to realize a structure. And the, uh, you know, the analysis side of this is basic. All right, you can see that it's, it's the... Again, it's that marriage of very simple materials, and so, but, but with high tech uh, is what the future is about. It's intelligence. And, you know, artificial intelligence is going to take away 90% of what an architect does today and what an engineer does today. Believe me, it is the, the future is to engage with technologies and exploit them and keep ahead of that curve. That, you know, if, if people who are going to stick their head in the sand and imagine the future is not going to be different, our dinosaurs will be dinosaurs. And it'll be in five years, ten years, not in a thousand years. It's, it, the, the impact of these changes is coming very, very quickly. And that's the, the finished project. Now, this isn't an Arab project, uh, so I should mention this is a University of Stuttgart with a, a whole host of collaborators in Germany and Switzerland. Uh, uh, but I, I put this project in. I wished I'd worked on it, uh, but I haven't. Uh, but I was really impressed by this. Again, you know, two robots, two million. But what's interesting about this project is that, you know, it's a, it's a, a marriage of uh, design, engineering, fabrication, construction, materials, and, uh, and to realize a, a building. And the concept of how to make shell structures out of uh, with, with this machine uh, came from, from nature, from uh, natural uh, sea, sea structures, uh, sea life structures. But that's not the point. So the, 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 the building I'm going to show you is basically made up of cells. They're like that sort of dimension. There are three dimensional jigsaw pieces, every one of them different. But that doesn't matter because it's all in a computer. And each one is made different by a machine that can cut a piece of, of wood and a groove in a piece of wood to 0.1 millimeter uh, accuracy. So the idea here was that 
that three-dimensional jigsaw is put together without any physical connection, except the best fitting of the pieces together, like when you make a jigsaw. Now, in reality, there are shear uh, connectors put in in the sides, but that was the idea. And um, they, on this project, it's um, a, I, I forget the name they gave this pavilion. I think it's Buga, B-U-G-A pavilion. And there's fantastic videos online, absolutely amazing videos about this, so have a look. But they, they want to do a simple uh, shell structure, uh, a demonstration uh, pavilion. And, you know, the engineering behind it in terms of analysis and all that, you know, it's high end and lots of value engineering and form finding and machine learning involved in, in coming up with a very efficient uh, um, system. And when I say efficiency, we're not talking about saving one or two percent here and there. Quite often in these processes, we're knocking 40 percent off the initial estimate of a structure by putting it through a process. And it's interesting, some architects will just go, you know, actually, we're not going to change anything. This is what we want, that's it. Other architects are, okay, you know, let's play together with this. You know, we want to form find and see how it works for the acoustics, for the views, etc. We share those models in the cloud and work on them together. And all of the different uh, sciences that are coming together and uh, design input is being put together online in the cloud in a collabor collaborative uh, way. Uh, and you know, my experience of 34 years practice is that that, that uh, realizes incredible, incredible uh, results. And uh, I was talking about collaboration earlier. So those two robots you say, saw, the, the principle here as well is delivering technology to site. So the, the whole project is designed that the technology and the machines fit in a container that can be brought to site and set up, and you feed uh, the, the machine the, the bits of wood. It can actually pick them up. It can uh, pick up the panels. It can hold them in place. It can glue them together. It can place the glue. It can, can hold them together and press them. It can nail, drill, cut uh, to precision, and then uh, place it uh, to one side. And all of those processes are done by a piece of machinery that has been brought to your site. And the, uh, uh, the labor on site feed the machine uh, with, the, uh, with the wood. But everything has been prepared for them. Now, this makes sense. You know, these are pioneering projects, and they're exploring. It's, you know, it's, it's not economically feasible in, in most cases, but the, the result um, of uh, technology combined with timber in this case is this really whetted my appetite and going, okay, I can see absolutely incredible uh, possibilities here for this uh, approach. And, uh, but this is one of many projects around the world that are exploring this area. And the idea is that the building builds itself. So the shape has been designed that you just connect the piece before. You don't need any formwork. It's self-supporting in every stage during construction. And, you know, you end up with some incredibly uh, beautiful uh, architecture in this one. So that is the end of my presentation, but I still have a couple of minutes. I want to show one other project then, quickly. And this is the Ladakh School in India. And this is the earliest example for, for me where we took high tech, the prowess and, and uh, sophistication of high powered, uh, in this case, analysis models to deliver something in a very remote location uh, and that influenced uh, the indigenous architecture and uh, it's, you know, appropriate, it's a, you know, it's appropriate technology in, in practice. Ladakh is in uh, northern India, uh, borders China, Pakistan, uh, uh, and it's quite close to the disputed uh, area of, of Kashmir. It's a beautiful place in the summer. 
and uh, it's a, a, a Buddhist community, and uh, the, the area is dotted in uh, beautiful monasteries, and you can see the horizontal lining in, in those monasteries. This is uh, empirically learned lessons from frequent earthquakes, where, uh, and which has also then evolved into the houses, where in order to resist uh, earthquakes, timber, continuous timber bands around these monasteries and houses have protected them against earthquakes over the millennia. And uh, we know that that area is due a, a, another one soon. This is the master plan for the school. This is a project I've been working on for 26 years now. Uh, and local skills, incredible masonry uh, skills, uh, carpentry, and uh, uh, the thermal barrier on the roof, it's a, a very sophisticated mud, straw, grass uh, layer that's typically 300 mil thick. Um, incredible local uh, skills. And what we were doing was basically uh, across a number of topics, but we were using sophisticated models and computer design to say, get, get the lighting right in the classrooms to have a structure that was more uh, seismically resistant. And the, the one I want to emphasize is uh, the, the walls of the residences. This is where the school kids, who, who it would take them five days to walk home in the mountains. So they live on the campus during the year. And these are the residences they sleep in. During the day, uh, it's cold, but there's very high radiant heat. And that heat goes through that glass and is trapped in a wall behind, a mud wall behind, and behind that mud wall uh, are the bedrooms uh, of the students. And the, uh, it's called a trom wall. So when it's minus uh, 20 degrees, minus 30 degrees Celsius outside at night, it's plus 13 to plus 16 inside the rooms because of the free heating collected by that wall during the night. How did we know how to size that wall? We used the most sophisticated software that we were using to design uh, high-end uh, bank offices in the city of London. Very sophisticated software that looks at triple glazed facades and their, import, their uh, performance and uh, air circulation, etc. With the same software, we can model mud, sheep's wool, silk parachute, brick, uh, timber, and that is why uh, the building was successful, and it is one that I'm very proud of. And it was the success of that school led me to visit Bhutan last year twice, uh, and an audience uh, uh, with His Highness the King, who has put education number one on the agenda in the country, and asked us to look at their uh, schools around the country. Traditional construction has uh, serve them well, but they're looking to the future, sustainability, local economy, sustainable economy, uh, and responsible uh, design. And, uh, but, you know, they have an incredible wealth of uh, uh, traditional architecture in the country. It's a, an incredible place. I'm sure some of you have been there. Uh, within uh, beautiful detailing and skills uh, that are there. And they're, as I said, they're older uh, schools are still surviving. This one is 60 years old, still uh, being purposed, just needs a bit of, uh, of grading. But this is a school that was built with uh, Western uh, technology, um, which looks like, you know, it looks horrible within years of being built. It's a, a thin steel frame with press cement boards, and it turned, they thought it would be rapid and save, save money but it turned into a nightmare for them. What was supposed to take three months took two years, with all of these products being imported. And they turned their back on their own technology and, and materials. And so what we have been asked to do is to help uh, the Ministry of Education re-examine the design uh, principles and drivers for the future expansion of the uh, National Schools Program in uh, Bhutan, and I'm very happy to be a part of that team. Uh, and, yeah, you can see some details there. 
And I'm going to finish with food. We started with balut. We're going to finish with a, the, you know, the most popular dish in, in the country is, is pork. Um, and uh, yes, I can still just about sit on the floor. So thank you very much for your patience and uh, hope you enjoyed that. Thank you so much, Rory. Guys, can we please have another round of applause for Rory McGowan?